All right, good morning. This is Sunday School. If you have your Bibles, please turn to the book of Acts in chapter number 19. We're going to continue on talking about these vagabond Jews. These are individuals who were traveling and they were performing, quote unquote, exorcisms. And so that exorcism is the concept that there is a spiritual world that is unseen, that people do not um, uh, really can't, can't visibly see, but it does interact with the carnal world. And it's, it's very real, okay? There's a real aspect to why people say, and, and why God says to the nation of Israel, do not engage in witchcraft. Do not consult mediums. Do not consult necromancers. Do not go into these individuals. Don't do it, right? So if it was nothing, it would need to be even discussed. God could just say, look, that's nothing. It doesn't really matter. However, we do know that it is something, right? I mean, the scripture shows us repeated instances in which that spiritual world has a great impact on the carnal world. Today, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood, are we? Do we go out on a regular basis and start throwing punches? No, but we do do what? We wrestle against that, that spiritual world, which is trying to do the ultimate thing, which is to frustrate the will of God. Which God's will today is what? The will of God is that all men be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. And if that is his will, that should be our will also, right? Is that your will today? It's my will. It's my desire. I want everybody to believe the gospel. And sometimes I sit there and go, why, why won't you believe it? And what is that? Does that give credibility to like these seance readers and tarot card readers? And to an extent. Many of them are doing it underneath the false pretenses that they had no power at all like Simon the Sorcerer. Simon the Sorcerer had zero power. He just deceived everybody thinking that he had power. He didn't have any. But there are some individuals who do and can talk and are possessed and do have the ability to talk to the spiritual world. No doubt. Like some of the higher priests in the Catholic... I wouldn't doubt that for a second. No, not for a second. These individuals. You have to think about it too. When Satan's on the earth, and when somebody's or Jesus Christ on the earth, Satan is going to go after the individual who has the most impact and the most power. Who would that be? Oh. Well, Jesus Christ at the time of, of now, right? Jesus, I mean, at the time when Jesus Christ was on the earth. When Christ is on the earth, who has the most sphere of influence? Who's got the, well, be Jesus Christ. So what does Satan do in Matthew chapter number four? He walks up to Jesus Christ and says, hey, hey, let me talk to you about a couple things here. And what does Christ do? He uses the word of God against Satan who uses the what? The Word of God. And so in that you can see that that's Satan, of course, he's not somebody who can be in all places at all times, yet many did what? Did not keep their first estate. They were lovers of that strange flesh and they went out and did what? They followed after the lives of Satan. And they, they, were, they became, as, as the, the, you know, the book of Jude talks about, some of those angels are reserved, but others are not and others have been out. And that is why you see like Legion, for example, is one that is actually named. We are many. You see this one here that who, you know, of course, Paul is doing these special miracles and this evil spirit knows for a fact who Jesus is. There are several passages in the scripture in which Jesus rebukes those individuals and tells them not to speak that he is the Christ because he does not need their testimony. But further, Christ, you know, it reiterates the fact that they are prone and they are their destiny is judgment right they ask him are you come to torment us before the time okay see what's really interesting about all of that is that in what they are doing the, the spiritual world against jesus christ they have no clue that they're facilitating the reconciliation of the world do you get that that's the most, to me that blows my mind what God does is he says, that's fine. That's fine. You can do all of that, but at the end, you're never going to frustrate my ultimate will and my ultimate purpose. It's not going to happen. And that's what you see in the book of 1 Corinthians. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. Look at this. Remember what he says here in 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. Paul says, read verse number, uh, let's just start in verse 1. Just read this for a second. He says, and brethren, when I came to you, Okay, I, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech was, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in the demonstration of the spirit and of power. 
that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to, what's that word? Not, or nothing. So that, that nothingness is what the whole course of this world is headed towards, nothingness. There is absolutely complete futility in the course of this world. Do you get that? The course of this world is headed toward what at the end? Condemnation. That's it. Destruction. Right? The writer of Proverbs says, There is a way that seemeth right unto the man, but then there are the ways of what? Ways of death. See, so the ways that seem right unto man are what? What is the mindset behind most men today? What is their ultimate goal? Pleasure. Right? Pleasure. That's what they're looking for. To just enjoy their time here on the earth. and Life is short. You've heard that one. Carpe diem. Whatever you want to say. All of those phrases lead us to the course of this world. Which is to not think about eternality. Right? Let's not think about accountability. Or in the legal sense, culpability. Right? Being responsible for the actions and being responsible for the things that you have done. Our government really pretty much teaches us that we don't have to anymore. You don't have to be accountable for the things that you do. Oh, it's okay. Don't worry about it. If you had premarital sex and you had a baby. Don't worry about it. We have an out for that now. It's called abortion, right? Well, that's just taking the consequences that are natural, right? It's not like you didn't know that could occur, right? It's pretty common. But you want to get out of that, lose the responsibility in what takes place. Then you want, to, you want to terminate, you want to kill, you want to murder, right? Why? Because that's the pleasurous aspect thing to do. I don't want to have to have the responsibility of upbringing children. For those who have done it, it's, it ain't easy. It's a lot of work. It's, it's exhausting. And to them, they think and go, oh, I don't want to participate in that, right? Well, they have an out. And so with these guys here, the princes of this world that come to naught, Jesus Christ will be the one Lord in his name, one. That's how it will happen. All of these princes of this world, they can come up with all kinds of plans. And where do you think they get these ideas from, really? So what I was saying in Matthew chapter 4, when Jesus Christ is tempted of Satan, well, who has the biggest sphere of influences of today? We read some of those verses in the book of Isaiah. When all of them see Satan, they go, hey, aren't you that this weak in the nations? Remember those verses we discussed? Aren't you that weak in the nations? All the, all the kings of this world will say that. Well, how do the kings of this world know who Satan is? Well, again, he's looking for the individuals who have the biggest sphere of influence. He's not looking for the little tiny person on the corner with no sphere of influence. He's looking for the people who have the biggest influence, right? You can read. There's a, there's a, uh, there's a music artist. I don't know if we even call him an artist. It's by the name of DMX. Maybe you guys have heard of him. Maybe you haven't heard of him. DMX. Have heard of him? Yes. He's got a very interesting um, testimony. A uh, very interesting testimony, honestly. And some of the stuff, you know, take it with a grain of salt. But I'd, I'd, I'd read some of the things that he talks about as it relates to his uh, power in music. And when he went on Oprah, he told Oprah flat out that, yeah, this is satanic. What I was doing was satanic. It's for the satanic ministry. And it was weird because, I mean, I could tell Oprah was like, I'm not prepared for this. Where am I going to go with this? This is really strange. And because of DMX's drug use, which he then gets into and discusses at length, that the drugs are in association with the satanic world. And, and I can get into that for, for quite a long time, the psychedelic aspects of things. And, and, I'm, and I'm, that's kind of a tangent of this subject matter. Sure. Yes, I was just thinking in chapter 2, uh, wisdom there, wisdom of man, spiritual Right. Yeah, and, and not, you know, other sciences. Right, correct, correct. The, 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 what, what, what individuals look for today is, you know, like higher enlightenment, right? That's what they're ultimately looking for. How can I get the clarity, right? That's what, that's what Scientologists teach. You reach a level of clear. You reach a level of clear. You reach a level of clear. You've reached level 50. You've reached level 60. All of that. And that's the clarity that they're getting. Well, what's fogging up their window? Why can't they see? Well, they can't see because just like the blind Israelites, they're looking for self-righteous things in this world, right? And the veil will not be taken away until you look at Jesus Christ. That's the only way you're going to get clarity in the world. And, and I have friends that look at me and go, how, how do you even know this? Like, why, why do you believe this? This sounds really, really weird. And I go, well, what's so weird about it? 
go ahead, go on. Tell me why you think it's weird. And I, I, I guarantee you, I use fishing as an example constantly with people. Every time I go out fishing and I watch what happens, I go, this is the divine creation and the orchestration of God. That's the only way this occurs. The, the, the most recent thing that we do right now is we're on the full moon today. So I will be out fishing this, this evening, this afternoon. This full moon creates this tidal swing, tide, tide, you know, the, the rising and the, the lowering of the water system, right, the oceans. This tidal swing that pushes across grass flats and across areas of seabeds that will pull all the crabs off. So crabs have little, you know, little arms, little swimmers, little claws. They can only hold on so much. But when the tide's so strong, it like clears out the, the grass beds. And so all the fish, especially tarpon, will get there and they feed and they get into the passes where, what is the passes? It's a choke point, it's a concentration point for all of the crabs to start to flow, right? And they just eat them like little M&Ms, little pieces of popcorn. And I go, I'm just watching this whole thing. I go, huh, that's pretty crazy. This whole little, and every time I pick up a crab, I hold it and I just look at it. I'm like, this is, look at this thing. This, this is like a little mini tank. Look at it. It's got little arms. It's just, it's just so cool. It just demonstrates to me, where did this come from? Don't you want to ask that question? Don't you it just randomly appear? And so it comes down to, yes, there are aspects of faith. And I have friends say, well, it's just such blind faith. I said, look, I have no blind faith. I don't know what you're talking about in relation to blind. As Paul says in the book of Romans chapter 1, the creation of this world does what? It testifies to the creator. But unfortunately, what does the world do? They like to serve the creature more than the creator. They'd rather sit there and spend their years saving feral cats or, you know, who knows what they're going to do. They do all kinds of weird things, you know, uh, like Har Harambe. Remember Harambe? Remember him? The monkey, the ape, the gorilla. You remember that? The kid that fell in and then they had to kill Harambe and they all felt bad for him and they shot it. So the joke was, well, let's get little masks of Harambe and put them on all the little baby fetuses and maybe they won't kill them, you know? It's, it's, they're kind of trying to play that, you know, that, that like, look, you're, you're protecting, you know, you, you cry and lash out when one gorilla is killed, but you'll go out and you'll kill thousands of babies, right? Millions of babies. So it's like, you know, you say, well, that's, why do you always talk about that aspect? Thing? Well, come on, that, that to me is like the biggest Sodom and Gomorrah thing you could possibly do. I mean, right? It's so, it's so brutal. It's so Romanesque. It's so very Colosseum. What are you doing? It, it, that's, that, you think you have law and order, and then you watch that, and you go, that's, that's on a whole no, another level of, uh, of, of disgust. When, in Paul, Paul's writing here in chapter number 2. He says in verse 7 that we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom. It's not a mystery to us. You understand that? We, we speak the, hid, the, the wisdom of God in a mystery. We're not still trying to figure out what that mystery is. You got that? It's like the verse where people always say, you just don't even know because I have not written and your ear hath heard, right? And they go, You've not, you can't even get ready to know what God's got for you. And uh, I remember one time Russ told me that. He goes, you do know that verse goes on. I said, yeah, 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 I know. He goes, okay, just making sure. <laughs> I said, I know, I got, I got verse number 10. He says, but God hath revealed. Remember verse 10 of chapter two? But God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit, right? He does that through the spiritual world, through the, through the aspects of the, the, the reading of the scripture, right? So if you want to know what's spiritual, what is, the, what is the, the thing that is spiritual in this world? This book that we have. That's how you understand the spiritual world. That's how you understand who God is. God is a spirit. Those that worship him must do it in spirit and in what? Truth. Many people try to worship God. They do it in their flesh. And unfortunately, the scripture says in Romans chapter 8 that they that are in the flesh cannot, doesn't say might, it says cannot please God. It's not possible. So the world goes after the system. The way that the, the, the spiritual world works is they try to, to focus on your flesh. Now, looking at the remainder of these verses, he says, even the hidden wisdom, which God hath, notice this, which God ordained before the world. Now, read that last part. Just, just, just focus on that last part for two seconds and think about it. Well, we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world. I mean, anybody else getting excited? I mean, am I the only one that's like, oh, that's pretty cool. All right. Unto whose glory? Unto our glory. Glory. See, God's incredibly happy and thankful and excited for those that are in the body of Christ, right? 
Because he has what? A family. That's what, he, that's what he has done. He has created in the body of Christ his family. See, those individuals that have his, the angels who kept not their first estate, right? They followed after what Satan has done. What is that? Pride, lies, and murder. And what God did is he created the lake of fire for who? Satan and his angels. He did not create it for people. Unfortunately, what will take place is many people will follow after that same pride, that same deceit, that same lie. And they'll just, they'll believe it. And they don't think that they're being lied to. They think that they have the truth. They think, oh, this, this is the right way to go. We, we got it. You know, when you get down and you ask any scientist, I don't care who they are, and you say, is there a probability that there is a God? They must answer yes. You understand that, right? They have to answer yes. It is impossible for them to say no. They cannot do it. So if there's the probability, what's the evidence, right? What is the evidence of this world? Uh, the complexity of it all, right? God did not leave us without a witness, remember? He didn't leave you without a witness. He, they go, whoa, it would just be so much easier if I saw all of the signs, miracles, and wonders. And I've reiterated this over and over again. I say, no, it wouldn't. Because if you read through all the scriptures, starting with Pharaoh, they still didn't believe, right? Pharaoh sees all kinds of stuff. Moses sits there and says, well, God, the, the, the nation of Israel is still not going to believe. And he gives them three different miracles to perform and says, do all of these miracles just to prove who I am. And then a couple days later, after Moses is up and gone in the, in the mount, what happens? The people are out there defiling themselves, going back to that perverse lifestyle that they had in Egypt. See, what takes place in the life of a believer is they, those who, who unfortunately can even find the gospel today, right, find a pure, unadulterated gospel of the grace of God. I will tell you it's pretty difficult to do. A lot of people say things like, you know, believe on the Lord Jesus or trust Christ or give your life to Jesus or follow him, become a disciple, pick up your cross. They might use all these little phrases that sound kind of good. They sound kind of cliche, but what they haven't addressed is the ultimate issue of sin and your need for reconciliation, right? The sin that has occurred in your life is so much more far encompassing than you may know. And I teach everybody that you need to know, understand the full force, weight, and effect of the law of Moses upon your life. You need to see it to then experience the full and complete justification of God. It's really nice to know that, as, I, as one of my friends posted the other day, it's so, she, she said, you know, it's just, I can't believe that God would work with such a horrible sinner like me. And I said, well, great. That, that's, a, that's a good mindset. You continually have that mindset of just being so thankful for the grace of God. You're thankful for it. You go, thank you, God. Thank you for that grace. Thank you for that grace. Thank you for that grace. And where sin did abound, grace did much more abound, right? So you live your life and you go, all right, stuff happens. Now, what takes place with most believers is they never get to that point of reconciling old man, new man. And unfortunately, they follow after this, the wisdom of this world. That's what they do. And then they become basically futile, and they're really no good. They don't have any real ability to work for God. They don't know anything. They couldn't tell anybody anything about the gospel. They couldn't preach anything. They couldn't defend the faith. They don't even know what the gospel really is. They try to, oh, well, it might be this. And, you know, so much of what we discuss is not just intellectualism, right? The purpose of church is not to intellectualize you. You know what the purpose of this is today? If you don't know, I want you to see this real quick. Ephesians chapter 4. This is the purpose of... People go, why do you go to church? Sounds like a big waste of time. <laughs> really? Wow. <laughs> yeah, they're so anti-church because what has happened? Satan has turned church into Starbucks coffee and, and you know, all the right crazy things that they've got going on. You know? I mean, Bridgepoint's got like a Starbucks in their church now. And somebody asked him, isn't that, isn't that selling out? You get a Starbucks in your church? Well, technically it's not a Starbucks. It's like, well, technically it is because they're shipping you all the Starbucks stuff and they're putting it in there. It doesn't have the Starbucks name. They got into this big, huge debate about it and how much money they had to pay for Starbucks to give them their coffee presses. Why are we even having this discussion? This is craziness if you have that type of discussion. And I can tell you, this is the most important thing you probably listen to here today. 
You will never find a verse in the scripture that tells you to go out and invite people to church to give them the gospel. You won't find it. You know what you will find? You will find plenty of verses that discuss your obligation as a member of the body of Christ to be an effective witness and testify to the gospel of the grace of God. You will find that right there. So what people will do is they'll go, look, I can just take my obligation and throw it out the window and put it upon somebody else. Look at that. I can shift it. I can shift it to the pastor. You really need to talk to my pastor. <laughs> what? I, I've heard that one 20 times. I've had discussions with people and they go, you really need to talk to my pastor. I said, I don't need to talk to your pastor. Your pastor is just a man. What do you believe about the scripture? What do you believe about the word of God? Because I'm going to tell you, every man shall give an account of himself to God. And when you're going to give your account, your pastor ain't going to be standing there going, well, well, hold on. Let me help him clarify that. You know, the judgment seat of Christ, you don't get to go, well, th this guy here. He, he. No, it doesn't work like that. So in the end, what I look at in my life is transparency, honesty, right? With people. Well, yeah. I'm, you can see Jason trip on the boat sometimes when he loses a big fish. He might get in the flesh. We try not to. It's funny because my buddies always go, you know, I, we see that like two sides sometimes of you where you get, you know, you, you're, you're focusing, you're work, you're, you know, you're, you're, you are, you're trying to stay in the spirit. The guys that know me, you know, you, you stay in the spirit. You know, stuff happens. We see you're getting, you're getting frustrated. You're getting angry. Stuff's happening, but you're just rolling with it. And you're just, you know, you're biting your tongue. You're showing that level of maturity. You're showing that level of maturity. And I'm like, yeah, it's hard. It's real hard. It's real hard to keep walking in the spirit. Sometimes I just want to get in the flesh and just go to town. But what does that do for me? It doesn't do anything. It doesn't benefit me at all. And it just makes it, makes it worse if I have some people on the boat that don't really know me. And then they're like, yeah, hey, this guy over here. And it turns into a testimony loss, right? I'm not trying to hide something that I'm not. That's why I'm always very honest and transparent with these individuals. I don't try to act like I'm somebody that I'm not, okay? Me, as in Jason Tripp in the flesh is somebody who is not a person that you want to follow after. I would I highly suggest you don't, don't look at him, don't stay near him. Jason Tripp in the spirit, of course, is a different, is a different thing, right? Jason Tripp in, in, understands that. He's, he's a different person. So with Ephesians chapter 4, with what we do here at church, it's very important that you read this how he says, okay? Verse 11, he says, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. And he gave some of them, right? So not everybody's an apostle. People obviously understand that. In order to be an apostle, you have to do what? You have to see the Lord Jesus. So I can tell you today that nobody's an apostle. Like people go, well, I'm apostle so-and-so. Well, when did you see the Lord Jesus? Oh, that's interesting. When were you commissioned and sent by him? Never? Hmm, pretty sure you're not apostle by the word of God. So they want to use that to do what? Why do they call themselves an apostle? To try to get something that they don't have. They don't really have that authority, but they want to get that authority by a title, by a designation that can say, well, I'm the apostle, so-and-so, right? Reading on, he says, and some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. This prophecy you were going to look at in just about two seconds as it relates to what this, this girl was doing, what the other spirits were doing, and what the, the necromancy is mostly all about. They try to go for it from a prophetical standpoint, and we're going to look at some verses in here in just a minute with Saul. King Saul. Remember what King Saul did? Very, very dumb guy. He didn't get it. Like, smart guy, but very dumb guy. After he's told by Samuel, and he's told by Samuel, and told by Samuel, and told by Samuel, and told by David, what takes place. He still thinks, well, what's going to happen to me? What goes on? Well, you didn't listen. It's the prime verse for, for uh, incomplete obedience, or partial obedience, is total disobedience, right? And my mom used to tell me that all the time. And I was like, well, where are you getting that from? She's like, Saul. I'm like, I don't, know, I don't remember that one. I'll have to look at it. But I, I see what you're saying, you know? The partial obedience is total disobedience. When you only partially obey, you're not really obeying, right? So when you read these verses, he goes on to say that he gave them for. This is the purpose. Why? So if you're going to be, in, if you're going to quote unquote call yourself an apostle, a prophet, an evangelist, a pastor, a teacher, the only purpose of that is not for you to make any money whatsoever. You got this? It's to do the perfecting of the who? Of the saints. The perfecting is what? How do you perfect it? You ever, you ever, anybody play music? It's a tool of this reckless, it's sanctification. It's a process of sanctification. It is. It's a process of sanctification, which starts where? With the doctrine. After the doctrine. And then what do you have to do with it? You have to put it into practice. Right? There's, there's the indwelling part of it that goes inside of you. So the perfecting is like when I used to play you know, music. And they'd give me a piece, and I'd look at it and go, I can't play this thing. 
And I go, dun, 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 and I play my guitar, and I'm like, I don't know, this thing's so hard. And I keep practicing it. I'd be working at it. I'd get better, and then I'd perfect it, right? But what would take place? If I didn't continue to, to perfect it, what would happen? It's just like the Word of God. If you're not continually putting it in you, you're not continually working with it, it's pretty easy to fall off the wayside, you know? It's very easy to just kind of get distracted with the things of this world and go, oh, man, and then you lose that spiritual mindset. And when you lose a spiritual mindset, I'll tell you, your life is not peace. Your life is, oh, man, now i got so much of this and my taxes and this and that, and all of a sudden you got all these, these cares that you didn't really need to have. It's really not that big of a deal. What are you worried about, right? And people will get so frustrated with it that if they could just see how, how, how Paul lays this out, it's, it's, a, it's to perfect them to do, as he says here, the work of the ministry. Notice that it says, it doesn't say he's perfecting them for the ministry. He's perfecting them for the work of the ministry. If Scott hires somebody at the restaurant who's 17 years old, never worked a day in the restaurant in his life and says, okay, here, go out and do it. They wouldn't know what to do, right? No clue. Uh, hey, uh, welcome to my restaurant. What do you want to eat? <laughs> you know, like they probably try to figure it out. How do I do the order right? What do I do in the system, right? You have to be taught. You have to be instructed. And so the Jews of that day, you know, they always thought they were very instructed in the ways of righteousness, but they weren't, right? Paul says in Romans chapter number two, behold, thou art called a Jew. And rest us in the law and make us thy boast. They, they thought they knew what was up. And then God says, yeah, but you don't. That's all that false knowledge you have. That's the wisdom of this world. So he goes on to say, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, that's outward, right? The work of the ministry is the outward portion. And then he says, for the edifying, this is the inward portion, the edifying of the body of Christ. The edifying of the body of Christ is to do what? Paul says that everything he does, even when he's out there scolding the Corinthians for their sin and their issues, what does he do? I do all things for your edification. I do it all to build you up. I'm not doing it to hurt you. The stuff that you're doing is creating problems. And this is what we've been talking about on the, on the issue of that, you know, the, the judgment seat of Christ and the spiritual rewards and the eternal rewards. And people will go like, well, it just, you know, it just seems like, I don't, I don't, what am I waiting for? What am I trying to attain? What am I trying to get? And that's a plug to go listen to our sermons that we've been doing on the eternal rewards. I think the reason why people don't care much about it or don't really, they don't really know much about it because they've not spent the time to, to study out why. See, I'm not saying you need to spend every waking hour of your life studying. That's exhausting, right? Much study is what? Wearing to the flesh, right? You will get exhausted. You will get very tired if you sit there and try to read the Bible, you know, 24 hours a day. In order, you need to, to take it as a, well, I've got to spend one hour a day, and okay, it's, it's Bible time. I wake up at 6 o'clock, and I read my Bible from 6.30 to 7.30. You know, like, yeah, that's, that's another real way to turn it into a legalistic law-keeping and not really getting the edification from it. You have to create in anything, you have to create desire before you actually do it. So in order for, to create desire, this is what this does. The edifying of the body of Christ creates the desire in you then to go out and do it. You got it? So the edifying here, as he says, is till we what? All come in the unity of the faith. So what that tells you is that people who are new believers, people who, they're not in unity of faith until you get to that point. It's a spiritual maturing process. I think people could understand that. Just like you don't become, hey, you know, a, in your first grade, you don't become like you're a senior in high school. It takes that maturing process. The good news is you can rapidly accelerate at an alarming, fast, quick rate if you have good, sound doctrine, right? You're not jumping back and going, well, Ezekiel chapter 12 says in Zechariah 14, and all of a sudden you're doing like 13 different verses, and you're pulling out one piece here, one piece there, one piece there, one piece here, and you're like, whoa, where are you going with all that? Like, that's a lot, that's a lot of stuff to try to finagle together and you just start asking simple questions about who's talking and what's going on you probably will find out that the people have a have an ulterior motive behind that so he says to we all come verse 13 to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the son of god unto a perfect man unto the measure of the stature the fullness of christ and this is what happens if you reach that point do you come to the unity of faith when you re reach the knowledge of the Son of God, when you reach that point of becoming a perfect man in the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, what happens? Verse, verse 14 tells you that henceforth, notice, that we henceforth be no more children. I can go up to my kid and I can tell him just about absolutely anything and he'll believe it. 
I can tell him that those tarpon are coming to church next Sunday. And he'd be like, really? Yeah, they're coming to church. Sunday. They're sitting in the pews. He'd be like, oh, that's awesome. He wouldn't know, right? Because that's what children do. They're easily, they're easily malleable, right? You, they're easily, just, you know, you can tell them. That's why it's so important to train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not do what? He will not depart from it. I believe that. 100%. No doubt. Here, I'm a testament to it. Got it? Right? My parents trained me in the way I should go. I didn't depart from it. Several times I thought about it. Definitely did. But I stuck with it for, for various reasons. Thankful to Russ and, and Frank and the other guys. When he says here, no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. Where does that stuff come from? Where does every wind of doctrine come from? Well, I like how he says every wind of doctrine because you don't see it. Right? It's the wisdom of men, which comes from who? Comes really from the satanic policy of evil, as, as uh, what's his name, Keith Blades used to say? Right? That, that, that concept of this is what they're trying to do. They have, they have a whole, but in the end, you guys say, well, where are you, where are you taking me with all this? So I get a big head and, I do, and it doesn't, doesn't do me any good? Where is the schooling system of this world taking you to? Well, they're taking you to capitalism and consumerism. That's where they're taking you to. And you go, no, yeah, look. Look at how it works, man. The average, average household is $30,000 in credit card debt. That's, that's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. Why? Because they told you you need to buy it. Because that's going to give you what? Happiness. It's going to make you happy if you just have that thing. I remember very early on my dad saying, think about it. Act like you have it for like a week. And then if you still want it, buy it. You know how many times I would do that and I would not buy it? I'd be like, oh, I really want that. Just wait. Think I have it for a week. Week goes by. Yeah, I don't want it anymore. I'm good. I'm off it. I'm on to something else, right? Because that's what the world teaches you. You got to get it, got to get it, got to get it. Because that's going to consume and it's going to appeal to your ultimate flesh, right? When he, he finishes off, he says, the wind of doctrine by the slight of men. Slight means what? You ever watch Penn Teller? You know? Uh, Teller is one of the best. Penn Gillette, of course, but Teller is one of the best uh, sleight of hand magicians out there. I mean, his stuff that he does sometimes, I watch and I go, whoa, whoa, whoa. Is that witchcraft? No, just kidding. But, you know, he does some sleight of hand things he's very good at. He's very cunning, as it says, right? And cunning craftiness, in the end, they whereby they lie in wait to deceive. And as I said, speaking the truth in love, you grow up into him all things which the head, even Christ. Let's go back and look at this concept here about these, these, this spiritual warfare, how it's, how it's applied in the life of the Ephesians, right? Who did believe the gospel, Acts 19. Who were unfortunately really tied up with this curious arts, these, you know, witchcraft, spiritual nonsense that they were involved in, but did have actual spiritual implications on their life. And if you read here in Acts chapter number 19, this is showing us in Acts 19 that practical sanctification, total sanctification, whatever you want to say, comes based upon education, which is doctrine. Got it? So you don't just believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of the grace of God, and then you no longer ever have any thought at all about any carnal or fleshly thing in your life. That, that's not how it works, right? But there's many people who teach a doctrine called Lordship Salvation. You may have heard that concept. And they say, you got to make Jesus Lord of your life, right? Or else you're not saved. So what they do is they go and they go, I made Jesus Lord of my life. And they did all this stuff. And then two weeks later, when they're in sin, because they have no doctrine... They go, well, I'm not saved. I guess i got to go get saved again. Then they're rushing back down the aisle the next week to make Jesus Lord of their life again the next week, right? Or you can just die daily, right? As Paul says. You can just live your life like that on a day-by-day -day basis going, yeah, yeah, I'm not trying to get saved every day. My process now is really how Paul says, how do I in this body live this life for the remainder of this life, Right? Galatians 2.20 is a great, great passage on that. Romans chapter number 7 is the whole real basis. And then Romans 8 teaches you that's what happens when you live a Romans 7 life. See, it's not like Paul, and, and I think this is what happens. 
They look at guys like Peter and James and John and Paul and Mark and Luke and the rest of these guys, and they think, wow, what upstanding people. Well, do you think that God recorded a bunch of their sin? Some. Sure. We're going to see some of Paul's sin just here in a little bit. When, he, when he's told, you know, depart, get, get far hence. They're not going to receive your testimony when he goes to Jerusalem. But he still goes and, and does those things. I, I believe that to be a sin of Paul. He should not have gone. He was told not to go. Yet he goes anyways. And as a result, he goes into prison. And now he's seeing all the more he has to suffer, you know, in, in bonds. So in, in Acts chapter 19... What I want to show you here is that it takes, it takes for them seeing this exorcism try to take place, it fail, it leap out, they all, it overthrows the seven of them, they run out of the house naked and all scratched up, all of a sudden everybody's hearing about this, they realize the reality of the situation and they burn it all. They go, we're out of it. We're done. So read what it says. Certain vagabond Jews, verse 13, exorcists took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits in the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, we adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul preacheth. And there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew, and chief of the priests, which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are ye? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. Wow. And this was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling in Ephesus. And fear fell on them all. Why did fear fall on them all? Because they saw the reality of a carnal uh, attack and they said, well, wow, if that's what that brings, we want nothing to do with any of that spiritual witchcraft nonsense, these curious arts. We want nothing to do with that because that, 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 could happen to us. They saw what? The consequences. See, so many people don't appreciate the consequences of their actions, and therefore they don't take things seriously. If you could tell people about the consequences of the actions of not believing the gospel and make them appreciate that that is a reality, perhaps they would believe it, right? Perhaps they would. You say, well, this is, what's the consequence of reality? What are you going to do with your life? What is it? And it always happens. I can, I can assure you. If you've never had, I'm sure everybody in here has had somebody close to them die. As soon as that takes place, what happens? It's like a moment of clarity. Everything's clear. And they can see everything. My uncle uh, just recently died. Probably a month ago. And um, apparently, this is according to my mom and according to my cousin. My cousin gave him the gospel and he did believe the gospel on his deathbed. Pretty interesting, right? Pretty interesting for somebody who was very staunch against it the whole time, very anti it the whole time, gets on his deathbed, sitting in hospice, says, okay, I, I, this, this has to be it. This is, this, I mean, if this is the truth, then I want to believe it. And it's just crazy because, well, you were so anti it the whole time, but you're seeing the end. And you're going, okay, I, I got nothing else. Who cares about your big screen TV? Who cares about your Corvette? Who cares about your, your you know, beach house? None of that stuff matters anymore, right? Figuring out what you're going to do with your life. What is it? This is your, this is your ultimate choice. And so um, what I think is interesting, though, is that my, my aunt, same thing. She's been a little bit on the fence, and now she's being very open, very receptive, um, much more interested in going to church with my mom, having Bible study. And I'm going, okay, pretty interesting. Because I can tell you there's years and years. Well, we, we were at a family... Um, get together. My mom is like, I don't know, a lot of brothers and sisters, like a 10 of them or something crazy. Okay. So my mom is a lot of brothers and sisters. We're at a family reunion type of thing. So we had like 50, 60 people there. Right. And, um, a handful of them are believers, right? And not a lot, but some are. And so they asked if my dad would say a prayer for the meal. My Ants all, some of my aunts got really mad about it. No, we're not going to participate in the prayer, blah, blah, My dad's like, that's fine. You don't have to participate in the prayer. It doesn't really matter. My dad's very diplomatic. Like, do what you want to do. You guys can go over there. We'll just say a quick prayer. We don't, it doesn't even really matter, right? It's not a big deal. And I remember we, like, we left that thing, and we didn't talk. Some, they basically kicked us out. And we didn't talk to some of my family members for probably a decade because of that. And it was just like a huge thing, and my aunt being, being one of them. And I think, man, that's so crazy that they get so... Why are you so mad about this, right? Well, because it's what it's all the implications of what it brings forward that there's a God. 
And if there's a God, then I'm responsible. And if there's a God, then oh, now I'm in trouble because, well, yeah, yeah, you are. Why don't you get justified? So then you don't have to worry about it anymore. You know, it's a great thing. It's a real nice way to live your life. Peace with God. And, and it's crazy. But they, so we lived the whole life. And this is, my aunt was one of those ones. And I, she, I, I used to always see her at Publix. You, if, you ever, if you ever went into this Publix that, that's up there on 113th and Park Boulevard, she worked there for like 30 years or whatever it is. So they used to be across the way. But she was there for 30 years. I mean, she retired from Publix. I and mean, that's a long, that's a long time of working at Publix. And I remember she used to always see me. And I, I remind her of her son. Uh, so she always really likes me a lot too. So she would always, we always get along. My, it was my, one of my closer aunts. And you know, going to the funeral, talking to them, seeing how that transpired, I could tell that she was so much more receptive, so much more receptive. And my, my older cousin, Johnny, he's, he's, he's been a believer for a long time and he's very active in his church and is, you know, he's pretty solid. Um, but you know, the family's just been in shambles. Our co- my other cousin's been Baker Act like four times now. This is the, because of the whole death of the dad, he's just went off the deep end, you know? And we're trying to help him and like, hey man, like, like this, this isn't the end. Like, I know you lost your dad, but you didn't lose him. He's not like gone. It's not where's Waldo, you're trying to find him. We, we know where he is, right? Based upon the testament that he gave. And those deathbed conversions are great. People go, well, you can't have a deathbed conversion because you didn't have enough time to do X, Y, and Z. And you go, well, then you don't understand the gospel. You should probably look at your own salvation and your own justification. When the thief on the cross looks at Jesus Christ, what does he say? He says, look, we... We're here because we deserve it, right? We're receiving the due reward for our actions. This man, not so, right? And he says, Lord, remember me when thou goest into that kingdom, right? And he says to him, what? Today you'll be with me in paradise. Whoa, whoa, wait, hold on. What about all the bad stuff he did? He didn't have any time to prove it by works, right? Because, you know, faith without works is dead and you need to prove it. And go- See, like, it's just crazy. People get in all these verses and they like to just pick out little pieces and like, we can talk about that for hours. I had somebody come to our Bible study one time and just throw James 2 on the table. And I'm like, that's fine. I got no problem with it. Let's talk about it. I got no problem with any verse in the Bible. We can talk about every single one, but we're going to do it not in isolation. We're going to take it into consideration of the whole book. I asked one person that brought up James 2. I said, what's the very first verse of, J- of the book of James say? I asked him. I said, what's, just a- answer me that question. What's the very first verse of the book of James? And they go, I don't know. So so, so asking, I think you should probably read it. And I tell you, this person took their Bible, went to the book of James. Not kidding, this is exactly what they did. Went to the book of James. This is exactly what they did. They would, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. I said, that's not the first verse. And they looked at me and they went, yeah, it is. I said, it's not the first verse. Let me see your Bible. Look at the Bible. Sure enough, if you ever notice how the Bibles are, you know, this, is, this Bible has some little commentary up at the top. Verse 1's up here in the commentary. Then it starts verse 2 down here in the text. I said, that's weird. Why would they do that? Because now verse 1's kind of a little hard to explain. You got to go, well, what does that mean, right? Where it says, James, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, and the 12 tribes that are scattered abroad greeting. That's kind of weird. I got to figure out how that works, huh? I got to figure out how I'm supposed to do that. You know, we joke about mail all the time, right? What mail are you reading? You know, what, what mail should you read? Well, things that are addressed to you. How do you know the things that are addressed to you? Is the whole Bible beneficial for doctrine, for proof, for correction, instruction, and righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works? Well, yeah, no doubt. Okay? And I'm not disagreeing with that. But I will tell you that you're not going to go back and you're not going to go do the basics of the basics, animal sacrifices, right? They'll say, well, I'm not going to do that one. Okay, so wait, you, there are certain things that you're not going to do. Yeah, we're not going to do animal sacrifices. Okay. Well, what about uh, purification? Oh, that's a little weird one. I don't know about that one, right? They, they like to pick and choose the select pieces that you got to do. So with all of these things, th- people become much more receptive when they see the reality of the consequences of the actions. And in Acts chapter 19, they saw it. Oh, they saw it all right. They heard about it. They saw these guys get overthrown and they went, burn it all. Now notice, burn it all. Not not, let me sell it, let me put it on eBay, let me try to get a couple dollars for it. I know I got all that stuff that I probably shouldn't have, but I'm just going to go and try to sell it, make a couple dollars on it, right? Well, that's no. You need to destroy it. If it's not good for you, it's not good for anybody in this world. And as you see, many that believed came and did what? What's that word? I like that word. Confessed. What does it mean to confess? 
Oh, I'm admitting that. Look at that. It's wrong. No, no. We're away from that. They confessed and they did what? They showed their deeds. They put it out there for them to see, right? And they, they wanted to, to, look, this is not right. And they, look, if you're going to burn all this stuff, don't you think other people are going to see this? What's that big fire over there going on? Dude, that's all the Ephesians. They're burning all their books and crazy stuff. Why are they doing that? You didn't hear what happened? Well, what happens because of that? Notice this. He says, And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. And many of them also, which used curious arts, brought their books together and burned them before all men. Notice that. Burn them before all men. They wanted to make this openly that, that we were not taking, they were not making this, this is, this is bad. We don't want anybody to think that this is something that we should have been doing. Because clearly the people knew them. Notice, these guys believed. It wasn't that they weren't believers. They were believers. It's just like when Paul goes to Corinth and writes, in, writes 1 Corinthians. He doesn't say, all of you dudes need to just believe the gospel. Come on already. Right? See, the problem is, it's not that they don't believe the gospel. It's that they don't know any other doctrine. And what's the problem? Oh, they don't know how to sanctify themselves. They haven't figured that out yet. They're babies. They're so carnal. He says, I can't even speak unto you. I gotta, uh, you want to learn about spiritual things? I got to talk to you about you shouldn't sleep with your dad's wife. I mean, come on. That should be common sense, right? Should be. We think of that as common sense. But to them, because of the long history of being involved in that carnality, it's, it's habitual to them. It's habitual. Habits are not easily broken, are they? No. Habits take... Habits, habits are bad. You know, you've got to figure out... You, you, there's good habits, right? And there's bad habits. The bad habits that you have, those take time. They do. And you should see... I like how Rusty Soy said. He goes, do you see progression in your sanctification? I said, yeah. Sometimes it's just this much. Sometimes it's like, wow, I'm doing really, really, this has been really good. And you go, well, is that just your will? Is that just your flesh? No. But I will say, if any man do what? Purify himself of these. He will be a vessel meet for the master's use. If any man. man you have a responsibility, as Paul says. So you want to be, you want to be useful? Then this is how you need to be useful, right? He, Paul says, I do not fight uncertainly. I keep my body in subjection. I do the things that are necessary. I know what's supposed to be done. I'm not going out there going, well, I got these curious arts and these books. I'll just keep them back there because, you know, maybe, maybe they'll be worth something one day. No, they went out, they burned them before all men. They counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. So what is that 50,000 pieces of silver? I don't know. It could be you know, drachmas. They could be, it could be all kinds of different things. If you just, it's a lot of money. They were saying... They were, some, somebody was saying that, that you got um, one piece of silver was one day's wages. Like that was like, if you worked one day's wages, you got one piece of silver. Day's wages, one piece of silver. Day's wages, one piece of silver. And I'm thinking like, what? That's a lot of, that's a lot, a lot, a lot of years of people's you know, work they had put into these curious arts and these, these books and these things that they did. Well, what were those curious arts? What is that? And I don't know how much time we have on here. We got to stop. We got one minute, but we're going to talk about next week how, what this is. Why? And let's let's finish this. Let's take one minute. Let's look at these verses and let's let's finish this. He says, "Many of them which also use curious arts brought their books together and burned them before all men, and they counted the price of them and found it fifty thousand pieces of silver." So, right? That's like the best word. See, when you use the word "so," what are you doing? Like do 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 do. You you basically this is how this is how I used to do. It. I'm not even kidding. You. When I used to argue in, in court. And we used to have like a, it'd be a hearing or something or a motion to dismiss or a motion to suppress. And they'd be going, 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 going. And I'd just be listening, 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 listening. I'm like, all right, get to the point, right? And then they go, so, and that's the call. That's the point, right? So what's the point? What's the point here? So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. It prevailed against what? It prevailed against that spiritual witchcraft. It's prevailed against that spiritual warfare. So real quick, let's just, I want to look at this here. I just want to give you these verses and want you to read them next week. Look at Deuteronomy 18. This is we're going to pick up next week. Deuteronomy 18. We're going to pick up next week in Deuteronomy 18. I just want to show you this verse and then we're going to, we're going to close. False gods are nothing, right? An idol is nothing. An idol is nothing. It has no power. It has no authority. It has nothing. Okay? However... The spiritual world has what? Lots and lots and lots of power. 
Technically, the course of this world, as Paul says, is run by the prince of the power of the air that now worketh in the children of disobedience. And as we read here in Deuteronomy chapter 18, that didn't change. And I just want you to read these verses and we're going to close. We're going to read 9 through 14. When they would come into the land, he says this, When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that uses divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch. Well, why? For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord, and because of these abominations the Lord thy God doth drive them out before thee. Thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. For these nations, nations which thou shalt possess, hearken unto the observers of times, unto diviners. But as for thee, the Lord thy God hath not suffered thee so to do. And what we'll pick up next week is, why does he give this as a command to the nation of Israel? Because clearly, God knows what's best. And that's what we just need to realize. So many times I live my life and I go, well, why do I, why do I listen to that? Well, that's not what God says. Like, don't you think that God ultimately knows what's best in, the, in, the, in your life? Right? Well, then don't you think that he knows exactly how Satan operates and what he should be doing and how, how he's going to try to deceive you into doing other things? Well, yeah. Obviously, we had a, I had a long discussion the other day with my buddy on the concepts of marriage. And uh, we were talking. I said, well, this is what God says about it. This is what Paul talks about. Here's how it works. He goes, yeah, but it just seems so old-fashioned. I said, yeah, in the days of Tinder, it does. But I'm going to tell you, none of that stuff's going to help you. It's all going to be bad. It's all going to create more problems in your life. I can assure you of it. And they're like, that's why. You know, he goes, well, but how about this and that? And he was talking about... Um, the concubine issue, and we got into all that, and we, I said, yeah, well, I can tell you right now, it wasn't, it wasn't so like that in the beginning. And further on, we talked about the issues of, so shall every man have his life, in a singular statement and fashion, and we went through that, and the reasons why. But just, you know, look, at the end of the day, uh, be thankful that you know the gospel. Seriously. I mean, it's, it, it, just to be here today, get, get, uh, I look at it and go, thanks. That's, I'm pretty thankful that somebody led my mom to the Lord in whatever, 1970-something, you know. That's pretty cool because that in turn transpired to me being here today, which is in turn transpired to, I could tell you, 20 people who have been saved in, underneath our ministry in the last, I don't know, 10 years. You know, I, don't, I can't tell you thousands. Unfortunately, I wish it was thousands. Not everybody's going to believe the gospel, folks, you know. Your obligation is just to go out there and, and preach it. And, 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 and you're, not, you're not being a bully in the sense, you know, with it. You're, if you show people they actually care about it, eh, you might be surprised how much they are responsive to it, right? The more you demonstrate the love and charity of being gracious with the people and saying, look, what do I have to gain in me telling you this, right? Well, why, why, what, what is it, what is, why would I do this, right? What is my purpose behind doing this? And, and What's humbling to me is for a person old friend approaching thank you for uh, you know for their salvation and, right. and you know I didn't open my mouth at all right. which is very humbling sure and uh, basically because I was watching Sure, no doubt. Oh yeah, people people definitely look at the things you do, and that it's a, it's a it's a it can be a, a stumbling for many people because they go, well, and I can tell you one, I'll tell you the guy's name, Raph. He said he goes, oh, I don't know if I, why I should be a Christian because there's really no difference between any of you in the world. And I looked at all my friends and said, you know, touche. You know. All right, let's close in our prayer. All right, dear God, again, we thank you always for the gift of eternal life that we have through your Son, Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the justification that we have, again, always freely, 100% free. When you say free, you do mean free. You mean no con conditions on it. Not even at all. Not even the least bit, Lord. We thank you for that. We thank you for just the, the, the grace that we have every single day, minute by minute, day by day. As we go out into the world, Lord, help us to continue to be an example so that we may preach the gospel without charge. In your sins we pray. Amen.